our next speaker, it's uh, Gerald Toonstra. It's a senior data platform engineer at uh, Cool Blue. Uh, he will present us about data orchestration with Apache Airflow. A few words, he's a designer, architect, and developer with more than 20 years of experience uh, in telecom billing systems to drone control system to business intelligence. In his spare, uh, spare time, he maintains the best practices uh, site about Apache Airflow, thinks and writes about the complexity and competes in Kegel competitions. Welcome, Jared. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So, our presentation is about uh, Apache Airflow. Um, going to start with a slide uh, in Brazil. Uh, I've had the privilege to uh, work in Brazil for seven years, which is where I had my uh, drone company. Uh, two years before I left for Holland, I started to get uh, a little bit involved with Apache Airflow. I contributed some uh, uh, operators, ATP operator, fixed a bug in uh, the scheduler. And I wrote a book here also about uh, software complexity. So. Um, I got hired when I was still in Brazil by Cool Blue in the Netherlands. The situation in Brazil is a little bit declining, so that was uh, very welcome. And uh, for the past two years, uh, I have been working on the uh, older BI stack. We now have two. The, the really old one uh, was too poor to be actually be you know migrated towards a, a big data uh, stack. And uh, together with three colleagues, I maintain that and work on the old uh, legacy system. And as part of that effort, I recognize that uh, Apache Airflow would actually help us significantly in uh, getting rid of some of the really painful points in the legacy software that you have. For example, uh, reloading historical data and some of the inconsistencies that you get and the really difficult queries. Uh, beyond that, there's also a couple of things related to, um, for example, the scaling out in horizontal ways, how you go from a single server setup that has limitations on the cores that you use towards a setup that you can scale definitely towards the future and also towards uh, more big data setups when you have part of the data starting to become in the cloud like uh, ad data uh, and analytics data. So uh, the reason why I think Apache Airflow is uh, very helpful is because uh, it really helps to become an organization more data-driven. Uh, in the case of the company that I work, uh, we only have about 10 uh, data engineers, but there are about 40 business analysts and a number of other people that are working with data, and they keep you know, asking us about, can you replicate a table from here to a production environment? Can you do this for us? Can you do that for us? And uh, it's, it's a little bit, how do you say, it, painful. It's like you, you spend a lot of effort trying to do that, and because of certain limitations in uh, the legacy software, uh, reloading historical data all the time is complicated because it doesn't accept the right parameters and some other issues. So the way forward that we identified was that by using a better tool set that would be open to more people that is easy enough to use for them, we can actually uh, multiply the efforts that we have together to get data in the right places uh, in, uh, in the company so that it doesn't all depend on one single um, uh, group of people that need to do that. So that used to be the, the, you know, the old BI development uh, part where you only had uh, some four or eight or you know, some teams of, uh, uh, with people that would um, move the data and create reports and make them available to people in the business. There's many more people now that are using um, a, a lot of the data to, to generate their own reports and many times also on an ad hoc basis. So the, the objective, what, what I think, is, if I explain what the impact is of Airflow, is basically that uh, in a modern organization, there's still a lot of uh, effort that you spend on ETL and data warehousing, and that goes from replicating tables to figuring out how to put them into a star model uh, with a limited uh, team that is also getting more pressure from the outside to help out in some of the other efforts with ad hoc reporting, for example. And that means that the, the time that they can spend on machine learning and deep learning, for example, uh, it, it takes time away from that. So if you find a tool that is able to make it easier for everybody, also for the team itself, in my case, uh, it, it is already uh, very helpful. Uh, you can actually increase the amount of data science, machine learning, and deep learning that you have in terms of an effort for uh, a particular company. 
So what I'm going to uh, do first is a little bit uh, show you the, the design of Airflow itself. Uh, Airflow, Apache Airflow uh, is incubating. It was started by Airbnb. Airbnb, uh, you also saw this uh, name called Superset, which is Apache Superset, also from Airbnb. And they, I think they are really at the forefront of really useful products that you can use for uh, big data in a company. So Airflow itself consists of a web server that's a user interface. In the user interface, you're able to restart jobs or look at how the different uh, workflows are running. And uh, that is connected to a database. And that database maintains your workflow information. When you run a number of tasks as part of a workflow, uh, all of those tasks, they get uh, started and ended uh, at particular times. And it keeps track of which have run for a particular workflow instance. So it also keeps track whether something ran yesterday, whether it ran the day before. And uh, that doesn't always happen in all the schedulers out there because uh, in the company that I work, they used to use something called SSIS, and it has very specific times when that should run on a particular time. It just says, start this at 1 a.m., uh, but it doesn't necessarily keep track uh, of all the times when it has actually run before. Um, so uh, another part uh, that is the most important is the, uh, the scheduler itself. That is uh, another uh, process that runs, and what that does, it interfaces with the SQL database in order to figure out what, the, what tasks to run at that particular time in a workflow. Because in a typical workflow, you have dependencies that you figure out. And then when one of the dependencies has finished, then it knows that it can start working on another task instance uh, downstream. And as I said, uh, Airflow gives you horizontal scalability. Uh, it allows you to have a number of different users that you set up, either as Docker containers or as EC2 instances on AWS or you know, run them as compute in, uh, on uh, Google Compute. Uh, but it can also help, uh, it, I think in uh, Airbnb, they have this running on uh, an internal data center. So it can run on a variety of different environments. Uh, in this case, I just uh, created an architecture design uh, using the Google Cloud uh, components. Uh, this is a slide that uh, demonstrates uh, the, well, the user interface that you have. At the top, you see what we call a DAG. A DAG is a directed acyclic graph, and a directed acyclic graph is basically uh, the workflow itself. It describes a couple of tasks that are going to be run, and those tasks can be pick up a file from an FTP, put it on Google Cloud uh, uh, storage, for example. And uh, as you progress through the workflow, at some po point, the work that you intended to uh, have executed was done. Uh, at the bottom, you see more the interactive user face, where you have all those tasks uh, listed uh, there at the bottom. And here at the side, you have uh, the instance that has run for that particular moment in time. So what Airflow is trying to impose on you is that you start to think about managing your data using particular time intervals. So you have a particular day that you want this to run, and then you load all the data incrementally instead of loading all your data for the whole table on a daily basis. Because at some point, and then your data grows, that doesn't make it scalable anymore. So you run into issues. Oops. So um, here, uh, I have, uh, at the company, we, we did a, a POC on Airflow, and we chose AWS, uh, Amazon Services. Uh, the reason is that because the whole web shop is already located on that, and the people that are knowledgeable in this particular area, uh, they already knew how to set up uh, the environment and also use, for example, uh, CloudFormation, uh, CloudWatch, and uh, Amazon EZR. Those are the, the, the components that you would use uh, uh, in this particular case. Uh, I also show uh, Splunk because there's a couple of different things. You also want to see how, what the application has done or what it is doing. And uh, this is one of the ways to, uh, to actually uh, look at the logging from, uh, that comes out of all the processing that is going to happen. And in some cases, that can be quite significant because you have uh, 5,000 workflows on a given day at, uh, for certain setups. So uh, I showed you the design before. Here's where we start to work in the design, how that is, uh, lo where that is located. Uh, there are two availability zones, and this would be you start with the web server and the workers and uh, the scheduler. So you just configure them as uh, Docker containers or as easy to instances that have uh, uh, auto-scaling on, uh, on top of them. 
one of the issues that you run into is that these uh, DAGs, these workflows, they are not static. You would start working with them by your developers or, or the people that develop on them. And uh, you need to synchronize access to that to all the workers in the scheduler because if they are not the same, uh, then at some point you have issues that you don't know what kind of software you're, you're running. In order to not have to log into every server and deploy those workflows there and make sure that when they get run, they're exactly the same version. Uh, the suggestion here was to use uh, EFS, which is a, a shared file system, which basically guarantees that on every different host, the version of that will be probably the same. There's only a very small window where such things can go wrong. Uh, but at least you don't run into issues where you have to log into servers to deploy versions there. And when you have a, a large number, that can actually make that window significantly larger. And to finish that off, I was talking about the database. Uh, there's a database set up there as well, uh, using Postgres and uh, Redis, um, where you would basically uh, keep the, the data, the metadata, and make backups, because if you lose it, you would probably, you might have to reload all the, the data again, or you have to manually clear that. So that's pretty important. So from that design of how that setup works in uh, Amazon, I'm going to you know, create a, a slightly bigger picture about uh, how we are uh, going to use that also in the future. We are halfway uh, through uh, making up that, that setup. Uh, this little part here in the Amazon Cloud is uh, the setup for, uh, for Airflow itself. That's the core of the system where you're going to start to orchestrate your data. So this is where all the code runs. That's where uh, the things get scheduled. Uh, at the top, uh, one of the really important things also to look into is the data service, which is where you're going to uh, make data available to uh, the end users. Uh, in our case, we use uh, the cube, so Excel is a part. We also use Tableau. And, but there are other p uh, tools like ClickView and Looker. And, we're also looking at uh, Superset at the moment and, and some other tools to do the more ad hoc uh, kind of querying and, uh, and data access. So uh, those data services, they consume from other sources uh, themselves. And there you have a couple of different databases where you're basically uh, what the destination of your data is, the, the, the end of your data processing. And that's where those data service uh, uh, elements uh, plug into. And at the top, uh, we have a couple of uh, on-premise databases. A lot of them are uh, disappearing, but with Airflow through a direct connect link, uh, you could uh, retrieve data from there. And if you do that incrementally, that's another reason why that is really important. The data size of uh, grabbing that from those locations shouldn't be creating a lot of problems because uh, it will be a marginal instead of the whole volume of all those databases uh, on a daily basis. Um, in, so Coolblue is a retailer. Um, we also have uh, uh, third-party connections. For example, we have um, a market share analysis tools or, or services, and we make use of uh, other mostly marketing uh, third parties. And they have FTP servers, they have web APIs, we have uh, our own uh, transport service in the, in the meantime. So we connect to those particular uh, APIs and services to grab more data and uh, combine that with uh, the other data in there to, for example, establish uh, transaction margins and, and other data products that you would need uh, for making decisions. Um, a final thing that we have is uh, Google Cloud uh, platform, mostly for analytics. Um, as I said, uh, a lot of the people that are working with data, they do not necessarily have uh, a lot of development experience. And what they actually used as the most important uh, tool is BigQuery on Google. And that is also because the ad data, the Google Analytics data that you use for analyzing what people do on the website uh, is basically uh, all in the Google Cloud platform. So then uh, you can actually set up links between uh, what you run on Amazon and uh, transfer some of the data from one cloud provider to the other uh, where it can provide the most value for people and ease of access. So um, the reason why I think uh, Airflow is uh, a very nice tool, it's not necessarily the only tool or the silver bullet, but uh, I started to analyze it why it is uh, so helpful is because it is built around some really important ETL principles. Um, and when you watch some of the videos of the people who actually designed it, you really see they come from LinkedIn, they come from Airbnb, and you know companies in the Silicon Valley. 
and they have a very different innovative uh, idea about data, and they need, to be, they need things to be really scalable. So one of the core uh, principles that is really important in moving data is that all the processes are idempotent, and that means that uh, when you have a certain input uh, of data and the data doesn't change, that when you process it once, you have a certain output, and when you process it multiple times, the, the output itself, it, it doesn't change, it is always the same. And that means that, for example, uh, you have some key uh, elements there for, uh, for example, when you um, uh, reprocess things for a particular day that you don't get duplicates or you have some other elements that if you run it on one day and the day afterwards that uh, you don't suddenly get the results of another day because you have a, a, a current date function somewhere in there. So all of those things need to run contextual. Um, that brings it to the next point. Uh, in Airflow, it, it runs using what they call operators. So the design itself has uh, connection elements, and we call them hooks. And those hooks, they are know how to log into a system and access data from there, picking up a file or running a query or doing something else. So those hooks are abstractions for the target systems, and you would use typically two of those hooks inside one single operator to bring the data together. So you have a source hook with a source system that gets data from Samba, FTP, Hive, or any kind of other system. And then you have another hook that is the destination system, which is where the data goes. And because you're running this on a distributed system and you don't know which worker is going to uh, pick up a particular task, you cannot leave uh, data in one particular worker machine. You always have to move it from a data address position to another data address position. So the, the components that you use in order to make it usable for other people, they have to be reusable and they have to be parameterizable because that uh, simplifies the use to other people. And I'm going to show you in a small code example what one of those operators could look like and how easy it eventually becomes when you have the right abstractions on top of your ETL components. So as I said, uh, data address between operations. Uh, here, this is a Google uh, Cloud Storage uh, URL that uh, can be used. You create a bucket for it that has its own lifecycle policies, for example. So if you're moving data once and you only need to be here for a day because those workflows uh, are only uh, running for a day, for example, you can uh, create a, a life cycle of one day or maybe 30 days or 60 days, depending on your requirements. And then using uh, the DAG ID, so the workflow ID and the task ID, you can uh, keep track of all the data, and uh, that makes it really helpful for you to debug uh, when there are some issues that occur uh, in some of your workflow uh, uh, issues, right? So, and then you keep the, 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 the data there as well, so you can track all the files, what happened, which data got processed, and, and where it went. And another element that is really important uh, that is being discussed on the mailing list. I'm also active on the mailing list and I set up my own site uh, for how to work with Airflow, is uh, the testing strategy. Um, so you work with a lot of software and you have the computer at, uh, you know, at, at the lowest level and this computer is already uh, being tested by hardware and then you have the operating system and all of those components, they get tested. Uh, Airflow core, so the, the, the scheduler itself and what it runs is also tested but then you get your hooks and your operators and your actual workflows on top of that, and you also need to think about strategies for testing those. So uh, I set up a, a site that gives an idea about how this can be done, so with actually a GitHub repository, so you can look into the code, how, what kind of strategies are, are valid. As part of the testing strategy, we use uh, regular unit testing for uh, the, the hooks and the operators, but on the highest level, you actually workflows where you work with data, I think it is important that inside the workflow itself you have uh, data checks. Because otherwise, when you only have operators that move data from one location to the other, you do not necessarily know that the intended operation completed successfully. So that's why I think it is really important to make sure that after every operation when it is required, that you have a check on the, you know, that the cost of yesterday is only off by a factor of uh, 0.1, for example. So I was talking about uh, uh, a little bit of code and what that looks like. This is an example of uh, an operator. 
Uh, you would basically have uh, this come straight out of the, one, the side that I set up, basically. Uh, I was talking about two different connections that you have, two hooks. One hook goes to the source system, the other one goes to the destination system. This is where you specify them. The connection details are specified elsewhere. And when you go on, you basically have a select statement that you execute and a destination table in that destination system. That's all you have to do. And then uh, parameterizable components, there are these tags here, they are basically uh, 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 template tags in, in, a, in, in a language uh, uh, for, for Python that they get replaced by the context of that particular run. So if at some point uh, you have an error from a flow that was executed seven days ago, you can clear that flow and you can re-execute it, and then Airflow will uh, populate the, the context with uh, what it was at that particular time. You don't have to create your own uh, workflow anymore to be able to, to reprocess data of seven days ago, for example. You can do that in the user interface. And the rest, uh, there's a couple of custom things that they have introduced. This one is a pool. So for example, um, it can be that you have a system, an Oracle database, and you want to only allow 20 connections at the same time. Uh, pooling allows you to do that. You can also use that to say, I have one GPU server for machine learning. Then you say, uh, pool GPU, and then only one task get executed on that uh, GPU resource at any given time. And there's an, a couple of other uh, components that can be useful for really customizing your flow, like uh, the queues. There's a queue system that allows you to specify uh, that particular uh, uh, tasks uh, are uh, sent to a particular worker that has slightly more resources, for example, memory. So uh, going back to the start of my story, the reason why I think Airflow is really uh, uh, important is because it helps you to reduce the amount of effort that we spend on ETL so that we can start to spend more time on the interesting bits, data science, machine learning, and uh, deep learning. Uh, what I hope that you know, my presentation has done is that it has aroused a lot of interest into Apache Airflow and the project, and that at some point, maybe next week, uh, you install it and, uh, and try a couple of things out. There's um, uh, Docker containers and a couple of examples also from the website that I set up uh, that basically allows you to set up uh, an Airflow instance in about half an hour or one hour. And uh, that was the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, definitions for the workflows, correct? I think so. So uh, th 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 that's one of the things. Airflow is completely programmable. So it's not just about programming what those operators do. It is not just programming the thing uh, of, of what happens in the workflow, but the workflow itself is also programmable. So uh, you have, uh, with using Python, you can completely specify how a, a workflow is set up. You can have dynamic tasks in there. If you have a uh, a text file with table names in them, for example, you can use that to generate tasks that should be happening or created inside of that workflow. And there's a couple of other reasons or benefits to it, uh, which I think can get very detailed into, you know, on, on your use case itself. What I did was um, we, have, we were using Azkaban, we are actually still using it for, for parts of uh, the, the operations. And Azkaban was developed at LinkedIn and it works okay, it works good, it, has, it is consistent, but there are very specific differences uh, with Airflow in regards of reprocessing uh, historical data and the ease of use for other people that are not uh, expert developers. For example, in Azkaban you just start a process and, and that's basically it. In Airflow you have your DAG, your workflow that gets executed, uh, but the, the coding itself that you have to do, it's, it's all in one place. You just import operators with a documentation site, and then people that are a little bit, you know, they are doing some development work but have little uh, development uh, knowledge, are able usually to, uh, to make that work. So, any other questions? Yep. No? Second. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. I would like to ask you, uh, how is it, uh, is it to scale the workers? And how exactly did you do it? I don't know if you mentioned it like in your diagram, but like you use Celery, you have a specific cluster that like a, is a cluster of uh, workers. So like, do you scale up and down according to the? Uh, you could do that. I think the main uh, configuration points that you have are, are queue sizes. And that's basically, um, 
how many tasks are sent to some worker that might or may not be active. So that is like the, in, in terms of dynamic rescheduling, when you have dynamic uh, number of workers, I don't think that's yet truly correctly addressed. But in theory, you can just add more workers that will consume from the queue. So the number of workers is in theory uh, disconnected from the configuration in the scheduler. But if you do not have a sufficient number of workers available to handle the load, then you might have uh, a buildup in the queue. And uh, that can have some issues because when something is sent in the queue, uh, it's a very complicated, in-depth uh, uh, thing, thing about airflow, is that uh, it is in a state where it can get uh, in the queue two times, for example. So it is uh, important that the configuration of airflow is configured in such a way that um, the queue doesn't fill up, basically. But that's the only thing. You can basically scale up or horizontally without informing the scheduler or the, the, the front end. Yeah? Um, I'm wondering, how do you integrate your ETL uh, done with Airflow with uh, your machine learning models? Do you uh, provision the model in an operator and then chain it with the, the pipeline you've done with Airflow? Or how did so, what is it done usually? Uh, I'm not really involved with, with machine learning uh, yet at this stage, but uh, there are operators inside core of Airflow or in, contribu in contributed code that are uh, Spark operators. There are some other operators. So yeah, as long as there's an API for it at Google, it should be possible to develop an operator for that that kicks off something else. And then you probably use um, uh, S3 or Google Cloud Storage to pick up the data or you grab it from BigQuery and, and other sources. So that comes down also to the, the complicated thing. One of the decisions that we do uh, in, in this setup is that you have a, a, an experienced development team that deals with all those technical details. They confer the technical details, they make them available as parameterizations, and then through a documentation side you give that to the data scientists and other people. So that means, in a, for example, in the context of a full inference engine, um, you would use Airflow just for like the preliminary data cleansing or, or data filtering, it, but it, the whole like model serving and running the actual inference would be done in, in a different service. It wouldn't yes. be done in Airflow. Uh, yeah, it, it, so there's a lot of possibilities because if there's an API available for it and you have something that you can use as Python to talk to it, you can realize it. There is even a bash operator so you can run things from the shell to do things. And in the worst case, you can use one of the queues and a high uh, memory machine to run a model in Python so that those machine learning things that need a bit more memory go to those uh, setups. Thank you, Jared. Thank you very much. Yeah.